welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Now I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God, but so do you. Thank you very much. And let's stand to our feet and let's go before the Lord and let's pray together and invite the teacher of the church. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. We have not come into your house this day to hear from a man or a woman. We have come into this house to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us. Encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. We thank you, Father, that you're going to bless us this day. But Lord, we say, we don't want you just to bless us. We want you to bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet, that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are brothers and our sisters, and we want you to bless them too. Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodist Episcopalian and Charismatics and Pentecostals. We thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center. We thank you for the Assemblies of God, the Foursquare Denomination, Ecclesia Church and Emmanuel Baptist and Trinity Lord. No time do we think of ourselves as better than them, Lord, but we ask you to bless them. Bless our Catholic brothers and Adventist brothers and sisters, Lord. We want you to bless them as you would bless us, and God will give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. Everybody's in agreement. Shout out a great big amen. (laughs) Go with me, if you will, in Hebrews, the third chapter. For those of you that are new, we go line upon line, precept upon precept in the Word of God. Why we do that is because God wrote it that way. We've been at this for a couple of years in Hebrews. We've only gone to the third chapter. Sometimes we go pretty slow. Today we're going backwards. We were going to verse 15 and 16, but now we're starting all over in verse 12. You say, how come? Because God said to. There's more to look at in verse 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. So we're actually going to be going backwards. This is part number one. Now listen closely to the title. I think you might find it of some fascinations and it's really an interesting title on how to say no to God. Let me just say this to you. Nobody wants to say no to God. When you say no to God, you are in trouble. But did you ever stop and think about that sometimes our words don't speak as loud as our life? What we do says a whole lot more than what we say. Have you ever been around somebody, you just know where they're at, they're not saying anything, but you can tell you're not going along good with them? Just by the body language. And sometimes we say no to God when we don't really use words, but we say it in our lifestyle. Now let me say this to you. When you say no to God, you're saying that he is a liar and you don't believe him. And then you make him angry and you're in trouble. And I don't want to ever say no to God either with my words or with my lifestyle. Because my life speaks louder. God's wise enough not just to listen to my words. He watches my life that follows my heart, that tells where I'm really at and what I'm really saying. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The mouth being your expressions of life. And so what's in your heart really comes out in the expressions of your life. And sometimes we say no to God when we don't think we're saying no to God. But God sees it and knows it and understands it as a big no. And then we get in trouble and we wonder why we're in trouble with God. It's important for us to see the analogy that we look at. In fact, we look at the Word of God, don't we, for an example. We look at people's lives in the Old Testament as well as New Testament. We see what they do that's good. We see what they do that's bad. 
so that you and I can learn to live our life. We happen to be in a section in Hebrews where the children of Israel are coming out of bondage in Egypt and coming into the promised land. And as they were coming into the promised land, God said, go take it. It's full of milk and honey. It's full of blessings. The cattle will grow. There's lots of feed. There's lots of plants. There's lots of vegetables. There's lots of wonderful fruit waiting for you. It's a place of abundance. And guess what? God comes along and tells them to go, but they say no to God. It's an interesting thing what happens when you say no to God. You fail, but God keeps on going. I don't want to be one who says no to God. So we're looking at how to say no to God because I don't want to look. I want to look and see it. I don't want to know how to say no to God. I want to know how to say yes to God. Are you following me? I'm going to read the verses, and I want you to know we're reading the verses not as a history lesson. We're reading the verses because we want to learn from their mistakes how us ourselves don't make mistakes. Why? Because God wants to take you to your personal promised land. God has something for you to do beyond what you can imagine. Say beyond what you can think. You'll go where you have never gone before and accomplish something you have never thought you could ever accomplish. And it will never happen when you say no to God. You're going to have to learn how to believe God and say yes to God. And that's why we learn by looking and by learning the word of the Lord. So I'm going to take you back to Hebrews, the third chapter, verse number 12. And I'm going to read to you from the word of the Lord and then I'm going to come through and I'm going to explain it to you so that you can understand and see where you might be saying no to God about things in your life that's stopping you from your own personal promised land. Verse 12, beware, brethren, lest there be any of you with an evil heart of unbelief and departing from a living God, but exhort one another daily While it is called today, least any of you harden through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confession steadfast to the end. While it is said, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all that came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry 40 years? You ought to circle the word angry. Oftentimes we think of God as some big puppy dog in the sky. But I want you to know something, and let me put it in terms that you can understand. You and I could tick God off. And the Bible says for 40 years God was disappointed and God was angry with these people. If you don't think that God is just somebody that goes along loving and caring all the time and is never angry, but I want you to know something. The Bible even talks about Jesus getting angry. Jesus braided the whip and ran them out of the temple because they were doing things that were not right and unrighteous. And guess what? The Bible says that he didn't sin, but he did get angry. And getting angry is one thing, but not sinning is another thing. He never sinned, but he was angry at a time. And here we see God was angry with these people for 40 years. Don't you know God's a long-suffering God? Don't you know God gives you lots of chances to change? Don't you know God wants to believe the very best of every one of us? Why? Because he wants to take us someplace that'll bless you more than you can possibly imagine. Why? Because he wants you to be someone who's excited about what he has done in your life life and in your future. Verse number 17 again, and it says, and now of whom he was angry 40 years, was it not those who sinned, whose corpse fell in the wilderness? Listen to this, whose corpse fell in the, uh, did you hear that? Is that a gross statement? Whose corpse fell, whose corpse fell in the wilderness? In other words, when you say no to God, you end up dying. When you say yes to God, you live in life. The key to whether or not you have to understand, this is not just words that come out of your mouth. It's what you say and how you live. And the word of God makes it very clear that these people said no to God 
and their corpse fell in the wilderness. They died right there and rotted in that land. Did God want that to happen? Absolutely not. Was God unhappy about that? Absolutely. Was God discouraged about that? You better believe it. God loves his people and wants the best of his people. The question is, do you understand that God loves you and God wants the best for you? Jesus said, I have come to give you life and give it how? More abundantly. He's not talking about just heaven. He's talking about while you're here on the world, while you're here on this earth, God has something for you to do. And there's a personal promised land for each and every one of us if you will just believe God. And not say no to him. So God gave me, this is part number one. We're going to do this again next week with part number two. But God gave me three simple things for you to see in these verses that they said no to God about. Simple things that are going to happen in your life and in my life. And we not even know that we really said no to God. Is anybody listening? Sim three simple things for us to see. Things that will say no to God. Here's number one. Unbelief. Unbelief is when you don't believe God. When you don't believe God who is truth, what you're saying is he's a liar. That's a shocking statement. Unbelief says, I don't trust you. I do not have confidence in you. And I'm not going to do what you want me to do. Listen to this. Unbelief says something. That the circumstances that I am facing are greater than the word that is spoken. That's what unbelief is. And sometimes what we do, and we don't understand this, we let the circumstances of life, we let the problems of life, we let the things in the physical world speak louder to us than what God says. And when the things of this world speak louder to you than what God says, you, let me tell you something, you will be a person of unbelief and you will end up having to say no to God because it won't make sense to you. But I'm here to tell you today, when God speaks, it probably won't make sense. That's what faith is all about. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things what? Not seen. This is a tough walk, my friends. You're going to have to believe that God said it and that God's back in it and that God's in it when you don't even see the results of it because guess what? The circumstances will always be there that are great that tells you you can't make it and you shouldn't make it. And that's exactly what happened with the children of Israel. They saw the circumstances. They saw the problems. They saw the trials and the pressures that were coming against them as bigger than the word of God. And they said no to God because their circumstances of life were bigger than God's word. And for every one of us, we're faced with that on a daily basis in your business, in your, in your home, in your marriage, with your children, wherever you're at. There will always be the word of God in your wallet, in your checkbook, in your economy, whatever it might possibly be. The circumstances of the natural world want to dictate the actions of a believer. When I say this to you, the circumstances of a natural world cannot dictate uh, the life of a believer. The life of a believer is dictated by the word of the living God. But we have a tendency constantly to go back to the natural, hoping we're going to get supernatural results. Can I say this to you? Everything in the Word of God is after its own kind. Genesis, the first chapter. Everything is made. Everything produces after its own kind. And there's no way you can get supernatural results by putting in the natural. You're going to have to put in the natural. God puts in the super. Then you get the supernatural because everything produces after its own kind. And natural cannot produce the supernatural. Only the supernatural can produce the... Oh, are you hearing me? And for a lot of us, we let the circumstances of our life, what we see, what we can calculate, how we can figure it out, how it works. And we get into a place of saying no to God. In fact, while you're there, hold your place in Hebrews because we're coming back there in the third chapter. And I want you to go with me, if you will, in the Numbers, the 13th chapter. And as I said to you earlier, we're going to read this account from the book of Numbers. The 12 spies were sent out. A, a leader, this is what gets me. These were the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. These weren't just anybody. These were the leaders, my friends, 
These were the ones that were leading the people. These were the ones that had insight into God. These were the ones that were special. These were the ones that were on top. And they're going out to spy out the land because God said it was full of milk and honey. This promised land was out there for them to go to and see whether or not it was for real. They bring it back. They see that everything God said was real. God didn't mention a problem in the place because God takes care of the problems. Are you following me? Verse 27 of the 13th chapter of Numbers says it like this. Then they told him and said, we went into the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey and this is the fruit. In other words, everything you said, God, it's exactly the way it is. Isn't that the way it will be in your life? What God says, that's the way it'll be? But the next word and the next verse, which is absolutely the worst word in the Bible, verse number 28, nevertheless, in other words, we heard the truth, but we're not going to believe it because circumstances are there. Something's trying to stop us. We can see and we can calculate the natural, and there's no way we can get across this. You can't in the natural, but you got God. And he says these words in verse number 28. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of the Anak there and the Amalites that dwell in the land of the south and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites that dwell in the mountain areas and the Canaanites that dwell in the sea along the banks of the Jordan. In other words, first thing comes out of their mouth is, God, what you said is true, but. Isn't that the way we are oftentimes? God, I know what your word says. I know you will back me. I know you will bless me. I know you want to open doors that no man can open. I know you want to close doors no man can close. But God, I've got problems in front of me. I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know how I'm going to make it. I'm not smart enough. I'm not cute enough. I'm not talented enough. I'm not gifted enough. I don't know how it's going to work. And we stop with God and we say no to God because we calculate the natural instead of evaluating the truth. Let me try it again. We calculate the natural instead of evaluating the truth. (laughs) Come on, you know it's right. We're all there. But that doesn't mean that God wants us to stay there. It's in the scripture so that you and I can learn and grow past this. The very next verse, which is one of the most interesting verses, is a guy named Caleb. Let me read it to you, verse number 30. And Caleb quieted the people before Moses. First thing he does is he says, shut up. When you got circumstances flooding your mind that tries to stop you from doing God's word, the first thing you have to do is shut up. You might say to me, Pastor Jim, we don't use the word shut up in my house. I do in this house. (laughs) You might as well just get used to it. Shut up means shut up. And sometimes we need to stop our thinking. Because we're so calculating about the natural that we forget about the supernatural. And we really end up saying no to God when we really need him to do a great and mighty work inside of us. And the only way to do it is cast down imaginations that exalt themselves above the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's what the word of God says. Second Corinthians. So for all of us that are in here, first thing Caleb does is he quiets them down. Wait a minute, you're all going wild about the wrong thing. You ought to go wild about God. And he makes this statement in verse number 30. He says, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Boy, this guy can see something nobody else is seeing, isn't he? Verse number 31, but the men who had gone up with him we are not able to go up against the people for we, for they are stronger than we and they give the children of Israel a bad report to the land in which they had spied out saying, the land though which we had gone as spies is a land that devours the inhabitants and all the people whom saw in it are the people of great stature. So all of a sudden there's this negative report 
Let me tell you something. When you base your life on the natural, you base your life in future failure. And you've got to understand that the promises of God are there for you and I. And when God says take the promised land, there will be giants. There will be circumstances. You will not know how to get through them. Oh, but I got good news. God knows. We're talking about a wonderful subject, things that say no to God. Number one is unbelief. I like number two. Are you ready for number two? Number two is when you ignore God's presence. What do I mean by that? In your life and in my life, we all calculate how to do life. Think about it. We gather information. We gather the data. We put it together and put it in thought and we come up with a conclusion on how to do life and then that determines the directions and that determines the activities of our life. In the equation of your life, you have got to present the presence of God. If you don't, you'll stay in the natural and do everything according to your ability or the world that you understand and never get anything done. What I'm saying is simply you've got to bring God into the equation of your life in order to get God results. Listen to what I, how I mean by that. You know and so do I that two plus two makes four, but with God, two plus two is whatever God says it is. You know you're facing problems. You know you don't have the ability. You don't know how to have the intelligence. You don't have the economy. You don't know how to open the doors. You don't know how to close the doors. You don't even know how you're going to make it. There are giants standing in front of you, but two words ought to come out of your mouth, but God. I don't know how to make it. I don't know how I'm going to exist. I don't know how it's going to function. I don't know how it's going to happen, but God does. And until you bring God into the equation of your life, let me say it again. Until you bring God into the equation of your life, you will always fail. And your carcass will die in a wilderness instead of going on to the promised land that you could have lived as a Christian on this planet. Are you following me? When we built this building, we didn't have any money. Only a few thousand people come into the church at that time. Didn't have any money. Every week we had meetings with the contractors. Every week they presented to us how we're going to need to do this, we're going to need to do that, we're going to need to change this, we're going to need to change that. Didn't have any money. Didn't know how we're going to make it. If I had calculated the circumstances that I was faced with at the time, your pretty little buns would not be sitting in those great seats that you're in right now. Are you hearing me? And you are sitting in and your children are partaking and the youth are partaking and the Spanish ministry is rocking and rolling right now all because we saw God in the equation of the outcome. You don't know how you're going to raise your kids in a world like today, but God. You don't know how marriage is going to work in a world like today, but God. You don't know how you're going to make it in an economy like today, but God. I don't know how it's going to happen. You've got to bring God in. Without bringing God in, you're making a statement, and the statement is no. But when you bring God in, everything changes, and that's their problem, is they failed to do that. Notice what it says. Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verse number 12, says it like this. I'll just read it to you. Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you with an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. You ought to circle the words. Depart. How did they depart from the living God? They saw the problem. They departed from the presence of God 
They ignored God's presence and they found themselves out in the cold. Do you remember the verse that I was just about to read to you in verse 33 of the 13th chapter of Numbers? Let me read it to you. I'll just pop it up on the overhead. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report in the land in which they had spied out saying, the land... Verse number 32, a land though which we had gone to as spies is a land that devours the inhabitants. And all the people of whom saw it were men of great statutes. And there we saw the giants and we were like grasshoppers in their sights and we were in, their, in our own sights and in their sights. Instead of seeing God, they saw themselves as losers. Instead of bringing God into the situation, they brought themselves into the situation. Get yourself out, get God in, because you can't do what God asks you to do. It's only God's grace on the inside of you that helps you to get through the situation. Is anybody listening? Do you remember Abraham? He's called by God. God talks to God. God talks to him. Abraham says to God, he says, you know, you've done about everything, you know, I could ever ask. Except one thing, I don't have any descendants. He says, well, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. I can't be the father of many nations if I don't have a descendant. I don't have any children is what he said. So God speaks to him and says, well, Abraham, Sarah, your wife, is going to have a baby. You're going to have a son. Now I want you to know, for Abraham, that might have been a very exciting thing. He was 100 years old, and she was 90 years old. The Bible says he was dead sexually, and so was she. This was the time nobody had invented Viagra. <laughs> Are you hearing me? In fact, if Debbie came to me at our age and said, I'm pregnant, I would kill myself. <laughs> and God speaks to him and how he makes this work is he had to get his eyes off of his natural and bring God into the equation of his life in fact let's just take a look at it if you will in the fourth chapter verse number 12 pop it up on the overhead verse 19 sorry and being weak, in, not being weak not being weak I should have highlighted the word not and not being weak in faith he did not consider his own body. See, you can consider the natural all the time. You can look at your checkbook. You can look at your education. You can look at your family tree. You can look at the mirror. You can look at your color. You can look at your size, whether you're tall, short, whether you feel good, don't feel good. Well, you can look at everything natural in your life. Listen to this. Didn't consider his own body already dead. His body wasn't about to die my Bible says so does yours. It was already dead. Being about a hundred years old. Have you ever seen a hundred year old man? Well, probably not too many of you. I'm getting close. But can you imagine? There's a hundred year old man. And uh, listen to this. And the deadness of Sarah's womb. She's 90. They're... They're going to fool around. <laughs> and he had to not look at her. <laughs> she had to not look at him. They had to look at God. Are you following me? Since it was about 100 years old in the deadness of Sarah's womb. Go to the next verse. Listen to this. And it says this, and he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Next verse. Watch this. And being fully convinced. What was he convinced of? Sarah's deadness? No. His deadness? No. His inability? No. Her inability? No. Her wants? No. His wants? No. His feelings? No. Her feelings? No. Man, they're past that. They have now gotten on God. And he said, fully convinced that he who promised, speaking of God, notice the capital H, he was 
also able to perform. In other words, it's God's going to, you got to bring God into every situation in your life. If you don't, you're saying no to God. Third thing we're talking about, number one is unbelief. Number two is when you ignore God's presence, you got to bring him into your life. The third thing, things that say no to God, and I like this one. Number three, you'll find this also in Hebrews, go back there, the third chapter. Followers of sin. When you let sin take your life and do what it wants to do, you become a follower of sin instead of God, and you're saying no to God. Hebrews, the third chapter, verse 13 says, but exhort one another, Daler, verse 13, while it is called today, at least any of you being hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Let me tell you what sin is so you can easily identify it. Anything contrary to the ways of God. One more time. Anything contrary to the ways of God. One more time. Sin. Evil. Anything, con- anything, anything contrary to the ways of God. Here's what I want to make a statement about. I don't give a flip about what politicians say. I don't care about what the majority says. I don't care what the rules of the land are. They can all say it's good. They can all say it's acceptable. We all agree to this, but I want you to know something. Until God agrees to it, it's contrary to the ways of God and it's sin. And it's so easy to get caught in a snare because everybody else is doing it. And you end up a follower of sin instead of a follower of Christ. And by following anything contrary to the ways of God, you're really saying no to God who says this is the way and the truth and the life. Is anybody listening? In James, the fourth chapter, verse 17, says it just popping up on the over. It says, therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it. One more time. To him that knows to do good. One more time. To him that knows to, you know what to do, but you don't do it. They knew what to do, but they were deceived by sin. They knew God had spoken. They knew God was going to be with them. They knew God was going to open doors that no man can open. They knew God was going to close doors. They knew God's desire was to take them to the promised land. They knew God was going to back them. But man, instead of following God, they followed the ways of the world and ended up saying no to God. And he who knows what to do and doesn't do it, man, that's sin. <laughs> Ooh, I don't want to be there. Romans, the sixth chapter. Pop it up on the overhead. Verse 12 says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. Wait a minute. Did you get that? Did you get that? Do not let That's right. sin. That means what sin has in you is your option. Do not let. In other words, it's your option whether you let it or don't let it. No excuses. It's your option. Do not let means I don't have to let it. I Now if God tells me not to let sin rule in my mortal body, therefore I don't have to put up with it. You will never go to God and say, God, I just couldn't break away from it. It just had too great a hold on me. By saying that to God, you're saying that that sin is more powerful than God. I want you to know something. When you got God, you got the Holy Spirit, you got the grace of God, you got all there's needed for you to to break away from the sin, but you have to make the decision. I can't make it for you. Someone says, well, how do I break away? One step at a time. You make one step away, then you fall back, and you make another step away, and you fall back, and you're determined you're going to keep taking steps until you get two steps in away. And then three steps, and you might take one or two back, but you're still ahead by one. And you take another, and you keep on going, and we love each other 
hear me, hear me, hear me. We love each other. We love each other while we're all taking these steps. That's why the word of God says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. If our minds are not yet renewed, we will still operate in crap. But I want you to know something. Crap city is over with soon because we're going to get free with Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. Now, for those of you that just thought I swore I didn't. Paul put it in terms the exact same word. The word is dung in the Greek word that means crap, biodegradable product. So I just said what Paul said. That's all it was. So don't go lying about me that I swore in the pulpit. But I got your attention. Bottom line, here's how it works. We say no to God all the time. We let the circumstances of our life dictate our decision-making process, what we know to do and don't do. Number one, saying no to God is unbelief. Number two, saying no to God is when you ignore the presence of God and you do not bring him into the problem, you've got to add him to the equation of every situation that you're facing. Or you're saying you can do it yourself without God and you can't, never will, get into the supernatural without the presence of God. Number three, You're going to have to be somebody who realizes that you're no longer ruled by sin, that you rule sin. And that you have the ability by the power of God that lives on the inside of you and the grace of God that God's given to you to overcome every obstacle that comes your way. There is no such thing as excuses with God. God has made a way of escape for every single one of us so that we do not have to be beaten from pillar to post and never have any hope. God has given us hope in the name and by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we're more than conquerors, overcomers, and greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Today, you can say no to God by those circumstances. You can say no to God by not bringing God into the equation. And you can say no to God by following sin. That's what they did, and it kept them out of their personal promised land. If God spoke to you today, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Will you hear that? <laughs> Woo! I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before I dismiss you. I'm going to ask all of you that remain, please stay seated. No more people leave in the auditorium. When you leave, that's rude. And people see you and they're concentrating on you instead of listening to the words that may possibly set them free. That's why I want you to stay seated. Just for a few moments, I'll let you go. I want to ask you this question. I want you to answer the question in your heart. Nobody will know but you and God. If you were to walk out of this building this day and your heart stopped and you died, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? That's the question. For the next few minutes, answer this question. Listen closely. If you died in the next few minutes, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Your answer says a lot about where you're at with God. So many of you would answer, of course, I'm going to heaven or I think I'm going to heaven. The problem with I think I'm going to heaven or of course I'm going to heaven, nowhere does it say because you have positive thinking you get to go to heaven. It's not in the Bible. You're not going to make it. Some of you might have said, well, Pastor Jim, I love God a lot. I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you love God? Some of you might say to yourself, well, Pastor Jim, you don't understand. I'm really a good person. I'm going to go to heaven because I'm good. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible, again, it's not in the Bible. It says you're good enough you get to go to heaven. It's not in the Bible. You're not going to make it. And somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to stop playing church and tell you the truth on what it's going to take for you really to get to heaven. So listen closely. Some of you might have answered, said, Pastor Jim, you don't understand. My mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. I'm, I'm glad. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible says your mom and dad could tell you're a Christian? Even if they had you christened or baptized as a baby, put a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck when you were a child. Nowhere, it's not in the Bible, that won't get you to heaven. Some of you might say to me, Pastor Jim, you don't understand. I joined my last church, sang in the choir. Helped out. I was a leader in the church, taught uh, Sunday school. 
helped the pastor, counted the offerings. I was just a leadership of that church. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say because you joined the church, you sang in the choir, helped the pastor out, a leader in the church, you get to go to heaven? Did you know that? Nowhere in the Bible. For some of you that are in here, you need to understand and realize that Jesus makes a statement very clear in the scripture. He says, not me, he says. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. In other words, you can't get to heaven any other way but God's way, Jesus' way. You can't get to heaven your way or my way. You can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get to heaven Jesus' way. And don't you know the one that was beaten a bloody mess on that cross and died on that cross at Calvary, raised from the dead on the third day, seats at the right hand of the Father at this moment, just so you could go to heaven, guess what? Don't you think he would tell you in the scripture how to get to heaven? Don't you think he'd tell you? Or do you think he just leaves it up to you like whatever you say is okay and whatever that group wants, they're okay too, you know? And if you want to believe, you can come back as a frog and be a squirrel later on and the next time you come around, go ahead, that's okay too. Come on, stop treating God like he's an idiot. He knows exactly how to get to heaven and he tells us exactly in the scripture how to get to heaven. And you need to know the truth. And somebody needs to love you enough to tell you the truth. Jesus is speaking in John, the third chapter. He says, you must be born again. There's no other way to heaven except you must be born again. Most people don't understand what born again means. But let me tell you what it means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be. Somebody needs to tell you the truth. God forgive us in American churches for 250 years. We've watered that down. It's all or nothing and I will prove it to you by the scripture. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus himself is speaking. He says, I'm coming again. And when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit vomit you from my mouth. What a crude and rude statement Jesus himself makes. I will vomit you from my mouth. But do you know what he really just said? He said people that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all and they're not going to make it because they're going to get vomited from his mouth when he comes back and you know he's coming. What's lukewarm? Little in, little out. Little up, little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance, that's lukewarm. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. God is something in your life, but listen to this. He's not everything. You're lukewarm, and someone needs to tell you you're not going to make it before it's too late. I already know you know who Jesus is in your head. You celebrate Christmas every year. You celebrate Easter every year. I already know you know who Jesus is in your head. But this is not about what's in your head. This is about your heart. Have you given him all of your heart? Have you given him all of your life? And you've got to give it to him because he's not a thief to rob it from you. It's your heart and life. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it or a manipulator to make you do it. You're going to have to do it yourself. You're going to have to make the free will choice to give God all of your heart and give him all of your life. And today, here we are in this safe and friendly place. We have sung songs. We have clapped. We have uh, heard the word of God. We have laughed. We had a great time. Now, today is for some of you in here. Today is your day of salvation. All across this auditorium in a moment, you're going to get right with God. People that haven't yet given God all of your heart, haven't given God all of your life. In a moment, you say, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? How do I give him all of my heart and life? In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. Why? Because Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. I'm a man. I'll see your hand go up. He says, but if you deny me, I'll deny you. 
all across this auditorium. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. You've been running from God instead of to God. I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that have never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, make sure. Today is your day of salvation. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one. Thank you. Two, three, four, five. Thank you. God bless you. There's six. Thank you. There's seven. There's eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Thank you. There's 13. Thank you. 14, 15. Thank you. 16, 17, 18, 19. Thank you. Anybody else? Real quick. There's 20. Thank you. There's anybody in the family rooms. There's 20. There's 21 back there. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Thank you. I see that, Ann. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Real quick. Give the Lord a great big praise in a moment. Come on for 2021 people. Let's go. Here's what I want you to do. All 20 or 21 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff. I want you to get out of your seat. Hurry. You got to do this in a hurry. Get your stuff. Nobody leave during this period of time as we bring people forward. If you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have, you can get in the aisle with them and meet me right here in front. Get your stuff. If you raised your hand, you're serious about God. Hurry. Get out of your seat. Meet me right here in front. You come right now. Come, 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 come. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Sure all I ever needed. You're all Come on home. I want. Come on home. Help me know you are near. Come on home. And you're all God good, and God good. All of you in front, look at me just for a second. I want you to look over here to your left. This is Pastor Dan. Pastor Dan's a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on, I promise you. The weirdest thing in church is me, and you already got past me, okay? But Dan's a good guy. Pastor Dan will take care of you. He's going to do three things. Number one, he's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. You need to do that. Number two, he's going to give you some free literature to not what to do now. Now that you're a Christian, what does God expect from you? That literature will help you to do that. Number three, he's going to introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. People to help you get strong. People that will be a friend, pray for you during the week. Make sure you don't go back to the old bar scene again, but you go on with God because you said you're going to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Let us help you to do that. A spiritual personal trainer is what you need. Someone will meet you before church service, buy you coffee, tea, nachos, help you to get strong so you can go on with God, okay? Only takes a few moments. People you came with, they'll wait for you. Make a left turn, follow Pastor Dan right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.